is Dr. Alan Clifford. Thank you. I'm very grateful to our two brothers for their kind and generous welcome. And it is a very great pleasure to be here in Cornwall once again. Will you turn with me now to the scriptures for the reading of God's holy word? And we read two portions. First of all, from the Gospel according to Luke, a 13th chapter, and then a portion from Paul's second epistle to Timothy. So the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and the first five verses. Luke 13 and verse 1. There were present at that season some who told him, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then turning to the second letter of Paul to Timothy, the third chapter, and reading from verse 1. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, But know this, 2 Timothy 3 verse 1, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janes and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith, but they will progress no further for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to lead a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, 
and they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And then the final verse of that chapter 4, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, grace be with you. Amen. May the Lord be pleased to bless to us the reading of his holy word. And now we continue to worship as we sing together hymn 127. 127. Jesus, the name high over all, in hell or earth or sky, angels and men before it fall, and devils fear and fly. Hymn 127. <laughs> Once again, it is a great pleasure to be back in 
in Cornwall. One's amazed at how rapidly the time does fly, which is, I think, a sign of age. It was five years ago, not three, that I was at the West Cornwall Convention, although I think I came to a, a rendezvous about three years ago. But it is a great pleasure to be here again, and especially that my wife is with me uh, on this visit. And we were last here together way, way back in the last century, 1983, I think, to be precise, uh, just before the birth of our um, fourth child, our third son, who is now nearly 17. So one's amazed at how the time does fly. I always feel a particular affection for Cornwall, I think uh, for two reasons at least. Uh, because uh, having a particular love for church history, uh, the history of Methodism is one of my loves and the stories of the blessing of God upon the Wesleys and Whitfield and others uh, 250 years ago. Cornwall perhaps more, had more than uh, the fair share that England was blessed with. John Wesley always loved to return to, to Cornwall. And then of course there's another factor, perhaps less spiritual, but nonetheless uh, fascinating for me, of course, the Great Western Railway. And it's good to be back in uh, the vicinity of uh, places where in years gone by we travelled the branch lines and, uh, well, you know, you men, we're boys, aren't we, really? And uh, we rejoice in those things. And then, of course, uh, to come again and to uh, have the very kind and generous hospitality of Eric and Betty Rodder and to taste again the the creme de la creme. Oh, I couldn't resist that. But uh, the most important reason for returning, of course, is to bring you the message of the GWR. Uh, don't misunderstand me. God's wonderful revelation. And that is the most important thing, and that is the chief reason which uh, gives me pleasure to return again to, to uh, this part of the world. Now, what I'd like to do is to direct you to well, initially at least, to the first portion that we read together from the 13th chapter of uh, Luke's Gospel, and in particular verses 4 and 5. Verses 4 and 5. The words of our Lord Jesus Christ in which he was answering certain questions put to him by those who were aware, who were aware of the, the sufferings of others in rather unusual and untypical circumstances. Verses 4 and 5, the second issue that uh, uh, they approached him on. The Lord Jesus Christ says in verse 4, Or those 18 on whom, on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise, or you will all surely perish. Now, I'm well aware that the, uh, the title of the organization that brings us together, the, the Red Ruth Christian uh, Rendezvous, uh, emphasizes the, the gospel which unites us, which we believe and which we love and which we desire to proclaim. And uh, that is the chief reason why we're here. We're only here this evening because of the gospel. No other reason, but because we believe that the truth of the word of God, the truth of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ into the world is the only truth which can ever dispel the error and the darkness and the despair of our fallen world. We still believe that at the dawn of the 21st century, as surely as we believe this uh, towards the end of the last century. And yet we know that we live in times when there are people who think that uh, uh, Christianity is perhaps on the way out. After all, it's had a fair crack of, crack of the whip and had two millennia of influence, but now the third millennium will be uh, the expression of other forces, other ideologies, and that really you and I are clinging on to something which is perhaps uh, well past its salvi date. There are those who would argue that uh, the old Christian gospel is really quite irrelevant in the 21st century. And perhaps you and I are from time to time intimidated by people who say these things on the radio and on the television and, and in the, uh, the articles of our national dailies. And perhaps we are not quite as bold or assertive or as confident as we should be because we're Christians in today's world. One gets the feeling, perhaps, that we, as the Lord's people, our voices are far too muted at the present time, when really 
to use his own words, we ought still to be among those who shout these things from the housetops. What I want to do this evening is to try to uh, address some issues which I believe not only demonstrate the relevance, the continuing relevance of the Christian faith, but reasons why you and I should be more bold and more confident in the message we believe and him uh, whom we love. To go back no further, uh, what a fortnight we've had. If you, as I'm sure you do as responsible Christians, you keep in touch with events worldwide and nationwide, and there are always terrible things that are happening in the news, you could hardly get up in the morning wondering what we'll hear next. And just two things I would uh, draw your attention to, I'm sure they're still fresh in your memory. The terrible ab abduction and death of young Sarah Payne uh, in the Sussex. And then just this last week, the terrible crash of the Air France Concorde in Paris. And uh, these things uh, do penetrate our, our consciences, don't they? And they, they make us think deep thoughts. So these things that tend to dominate the headlines. We arrived in South Wales from Norfolk this week and uh, put on the evening news and there was the news of the Concorde having crashed and it dominated the news, radio, television and the national papers uh, during the days of this week. And uh, it is important for us to stand back and say, well, what does our faith, uh, those of us who believe the scriptures, what does it have to say at a time like this? There is a tendency, isn't there, for us as Christians to crawl into a, a, a kind of ghetto mentality and continue with our piety and yet have nothing to say with the real events of this world, particularly when there are those who would seize on these events uh, and use them as ammunition against the truth of the gospel. And as I say, it helps us perhaps to hang our heads uh, to a degree in shame and lack of confidence in what is still the greatest message that the world will ever hear. Aren't there those who say, well, dear me, uh, this little girl, uh, having suffered in the way that she did, part of a loving and devoted family, if there's a God of love, then why does he tolerate people who do this kind of thing? to innocent little children. And it, it should make us angry that these things are tolerated. We're seeing the, the tail end of the, of, of the liberal revolution where anything goes, where people who are victims of crime get a harder deal than the criminals, where it seems that moral principles and perversion, all these things are, are part of the, the daily diet of our news. And uh, it is something which ought to make uh, serious and sober-minded people uh, shake in their, in their shoes. And there are those who say, well, of course, if God does exist, you know, why does he tolerate these pedophiles who do these terrible things? And they use this as an argument against God. And they make it difficult for us to speak. And I'd like to say to people like this, yes, it is a mystery why God does seemingly tolerate these people. But uh, it's no less a miracle that he tolerates you in your sin and your unbelief. You use these things against the God of heaven. Well, it's just as amazing that he tolerates you in your arrogant disbelief of the cause of the gospel. So we really ought to have answers to, to these people. And then there will be those who will say, what about those hundred passengers on board the Concorde airliner? They were going off to enjoy themselves doing nobody any harm. And then they take off from uh, the airport in Paris, Charles de Gaulle Airport, and then within two or three minutes, they are no more. Their plane uh, in ashes uh, on the remains of that hotel in Gonesse. So it's right for us to ask questions at this time. What have we to say as Christians at such a time as this? And I think we have a lot to say. And not only do we have a lot to say in general in terms of the teaching of the scriptures, but when you turn to this 30th chapter of Luke's Gospel, we have uh, particular events and incidents brought to the attention of our blessed Lord, not dissimilar in principle to these events that we've been thinking about. For example, when you think of the Concord tragedy uh, earlier this week, one then thinks of what 
We read in verse 4 of Luke 13, Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, says the Lord Jesus Christ, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. See, there will be those who say, well, look at this terrible event, these people, their lives snuffed out suddenly by this catastrophic failure of the engine of that Concorde, and now they are no more. Did God judge them? Were they more wicked than the rest of the population in Paris or in Germany or wherever? Uh, we could just imagine, therefore, if our blessed Lord was here today, people would, would ask him a similar kind of question. Were they, those passengers, more wicked than the rest of the people? And I'm convinced that our blessed Lord would give no different an answer to what he gave here. His answer would be, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And in case some of you are thinking that I'm stretching a point uh, to make a parallel between the tower in Siloam uh, at that time and the Concord last week, um, it isn't quite as far-fetched as you might imagine. Because as far as the available information is to us, uh, the tower in Siloam and the Concord possibly both experienced what they did because of some kind of structural and material failure. In the case of one, perhaps some stonework cracked, uh, some mortar perhaps had become loose with weathering and other factors, and eventually it toppled and it fell. Likewise on the Concorde, perhaps the uh, metallic failure of a turbine blade which could have flown off the rotor, punctured the outer casing of the engine, and then into the fuel tanks, and then with all the heat that was there, just igniting the plane. Uh, there is that kind of parallel. And yet, of course, these things do happen. It will not be the last time that a plane uh, will crash, or a ship will sink, or whatever, or a train might crash. These things are part of our modern world, just as they were part of the world in which our blessed Lord was speaking and ministering. Those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And yet for those who would perhaps use these events as a kind of lever to uh, ease God out of the picture of today's uh, population. We must also remind them of remarkable things that happen. Uh, the young woman, for example, who was able to escape through the window. And she didn't perish in the crash as the plane landed on the hotel. Some of you might not know that there was a Suffolk uh, wind band of young people who had gone out to France and uh, because of the trailer that was being pulled by their coach, uh, delayed them and made the journey much longer than they had planned, they were about 20 minutes late in arriving at that hotel. Had they been there on time, all those young people would have perished as the Concorde came down. Now you and I, as we stand back and as we believe the Bible, we believe in the providence of God, we believe that all these things only come to pass under his sovereign permission and ordination. We shouldn't forget these things too. There'll be those young people who were thinking, well, had it not been for the delay in our journey, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be returning to Suffolk. So events in themselves can always be used for uh, and against, against and for, when it comes to uh, speaking for God in the midst of the events in our world. And then I began to think, the more I reflected upon this amazing event, um, here at the very beginning of this century, something like Concord, it's gripped the imagination. This aeronautical wonder, although 30 years old, yet still turning heads as it takes off, either from Paris or from Heathrow or from JFK in, in New York. And uh, it seems to have gripped the imagination of people, just as in the case of the Titanic in 1912. That was launched as the greatest maritime wonder of the world, this amazing ship. This unsinkable ship. And yet on its maiden voyage, well, we all know the story. Perhaps you've seen the film. Uh, the less fabricated one compared with the earlier, more genuine one.
But uh, there is a parallel even in this. Uh, Concord was never billed as the uncrashable plain, but it does express a kind of philosophy, the confidence that men have in science and technology, and uh, their belief that if we do adequate testing and we are sufficiently skilled in our manufacturing procedures, we will produce this wonder machine. And that's precisely what they did. And so, for that reason, I think it's gripped the imagination. And that for the same reason, it's shaken people. People, you know, for this and other reasons, are not as confident in science as once they used to be. This is one of the reasons why you and I should never be on the defensive when it comes to the Christian faith. I mean, two or three hundred years ago, just before John Wesley's time, when science, as we know, was beginning to get off the ground, there were people who were saying, who were saying well, you know, science is far more certain and reliable than religion, so let's go for science and let's uh, leave all this religion uh, behind. That's what people were be beginning to think. But people are not so confident as they used to be. And the failure of something like Concord, for whatever reason, is an example of that gradual lack of confidence. So there are many people who are feeling a little more uncertain. Are we right to dismiss religion? Are we right to dismiss the reality of God, uh, as once we used to do? And people are a little less certain than they used to be. And that is why our Lord's words in reply to this query are so important. Because you'll see here that um, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, not only denied that these people who died were worse sinners than the others, neither did he get involved in the, the science and the physics of the collapse of the tower in Siloam, but he brought people's attention to the real thing, the most important thing. As if to say, well, certainly they were not worse sinners. Uh, we might add that they were certainly not less sinners. But the important thing is that we are all sinners. Whether those who suddenly lose their lives as a result of an accident like this, or those who might die in their beds. The fact is that we are all creatures of time. One day we will die. One day we will have to give account to our Creator. That is the single most important event which is facing humankind, which is facing you and I this evening. So the Lord Jesus Christ said the most important single thing in the world for us is that we must repent and believe the gospel. And still I think our blessed Lord would give the same message today. I'll never forget um, many years ago when I was an engineering student, about which I'll be speaking a little more in a moment. Our lecturer in electrical engineering, he started one of his lectures by saying something like this. It really arrested us, or certainly me. He said, gentlemen, science never proves anything. And here were we, studying science and engineering. And I thought, what's this raving lunatic on about? He's a brilliant man. He really was. Science never proves anything. And he went on to explain that science is not as certain and secure as people think. Because a scientist can construct a theory about some phenomenon, and then do lots of experiments, and say, there you are, that proves my theory. And then will come along some experience or some further uh, experiment which completely disproves his hypothesis. And his fame is transferred to somebody else. That's the history of science. So theories which are held now, and on the basis of which people may reject the Bible and the Christian faith, in 50 years' time they might be altogether different. But that's the way history goes. And science is not as certain as some people have made it to be. And uh, it does bring us back, back, therefore, to the uncertainties of life. None of us could be certain whether we will see another day. None of us this evening could be certain that we will arrive safely at home. My wife and I cannot be certain that we will arrive back safely in, uh, in Norfolk next week. I'm not being morbid, I'm simply being establishing a point that this is, is, is indeed the, uh, the situation. And that is why the important thing for us this evening and for all people everywhere is this. Whether you are healthy, whether you are sick, whether you are young, whether you are old, are you ready to die and to face your maker on the day of judgment? There's nothing more important than that, dear friends, this evening. This is the message of the gospel. 
Again, as our blessed Lord said in the Gospel of John, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the most important thing in the universe. It was then, it still is now, especially in the wake of the crash of Concord and other similar things. So the Lord Jesus Christ here focuses our attention upon the need for repentance. He says so clearly, I tell you no but unless you repent, you will also perish. So all the time our blessed Lord, he brings us back to the centralities of life, to the fundamentals of our existence, that we are accountable beings to the most high God who has made us in his image. That is the ultimate issue. And having mentioned creation, I don't intend to waste any time over dealing with the, the myth of evolution. I'll leave that to one side this evening. But um, as I've said, the, the whole question of the crash of Concord has uh, perhaps shaken many people. The articles that have been written in the press and so forth has touched us all. All those husbands and wives and parents and other relatives bereaved as a result of this sudden tragedy uh, in, in Paris. But uh, there is perhaps a, another reason why I am interested in all this. Because I am an ex-Farnborough boy. Farnborough where the air show uh, is currently being held. Uh, Farnborough, the home of the Royal Aircraft Establishment as it used to be called. I was trained in electrical and mechanical engineering there when I left school. My life was aeroplanes, not to forget the trains. My life was aeroplanes. Every time I heard a jet engine or a piston engine, I would always look up into the sky and see what this thing was. And in the a new plane almost every month. It was exciting for a boy who was interested in planes. And um, that was uh, uh, a time when it was a great privilege. It was a great time to be born for the likes of me, that I had the privilege of studying engineering at that institution, um, mixing with these brilliant designers and pilots and testers of the aircraft of the future. And much of the work on the Concorde was, was done at Farnborough. And uh, so that has revived my own past in that sense. I'd become a Christian just before I went to, to, to the uh, aircraft establishment. Uh, I was later, during the apprenticeship of five years, uh, I felt the call to the Christian ministry. That's why I didn't continue in engineering. But um, I had an experience which reinforced my understanding of the gospel. And I trust you'll forgive me if I reminisce just a little. It's another side of age, isn't it, when you start to reminisce? And uh, I don't normally do this in my preaching, but um, I felt it was appropriate this evening to, to do this. Because on the final day of my, um, my engineering apprenticeship, I was at that time working in the psychology laboratory of the Royal Air Force Institute of Aviation Medicine. That was my last apprenticeship um, uh, period of time. And there I was thrown among atheistic and humanistic psychologists who laughed at my face and it was Daniel in the lion's den most certainly. But on the last day, it was a day in September, a sunny, beautiful day in September, uh, down the corridor to our department came squadron leader Ted Smith and he said to me, uh, Alan, would you like to come for a flight? I said, me? For a flight? Yes. He said, I got to go and test a, a new flying helmet and uh, a pair of new electrically heated boots. Uh, by that time, my mouth was wide open. Uh, I'd never even flown in a tiger moth. All I'd driven was a bicycle, not even a car. So, and I said, well, well, what are you flying in? Oh, the Hunter. The Hawker Hunter. And at that time, next to the, uh, the BAC Lightning, which was rapidly becoming the hottest thing in the Royal Air Force. The Hunter was the king. It, it was almost an idol uh, for me as a young man to see the Hawk Hunter breaking the sound barrier at Farnborough. Anyway, that's what uh, we were going up in. A two-seat hunter, I'm, I'm glad to say. And um, so I said, but, uh, but I've never been in any kind of plane. And I should have had a decompression test. He said, doesn't worry about it, doesn't matter at all. You come down with me. So I got in his car. 
and we drove down to the hangar. I donned the uh, flying suit uh, and the helmet, and not a little concerned, I climbed into this plane. There it was, this shining, gleaming white, high-speed advanced jet trainer for the Royal Air Force. And I sat on the starboard side, that's the right side, and he was on the port side. And down came the canopy, and uh, we took off. And uh, it was a glorious day. We took off from Farnborough, and then we traveled due west. And I saw the world in a way I'd never seen before. What I thought was a car park was a housing estate. It's amazing how you can misinterpret things from height. And then I saw this needle sticking up from the surface, which turned out to be Salisbury Cathedral. And then we went further west and reached Bridgewater. And then I could look across the Seven Estuary and see South Wales, where my sister was then living in Porth Call. And then we turned um, slightly to, to port, that is, to, to the left. And then we travelled down across the peninsula. I could see Devon and Cornwall beyond. And then we came to Lyme Bay and turned to port again, and we flew back to Farnham. The whole thing took no more than one hour. But something happened on that flight which... Um, undergirds for me all that we believe as Christians. Now, we, we were flying at about 10,000 feet, and uh, we couldn't do more than 470 knots because there was something wrong with the trim. That was very reassuring. That's about 500 miles an hour. So there we were hurtling along at about 10,000 feet. And then he said, would you like to fly her? Now, this was incredible for reasons I've already given. And I said, look, I said, this is ridiculous. He said, it's all right. His hands were on his controls. My hands were on my control. He took his hands off the controls. And there was I. I'd only driven to work on my bike that morning. And here was I flying this, this, this Hawker Hunter trainer uh, at that height and at that speed. And, um, but before that, um, he said to me, uh, how about a couple of uh, rolls? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, if you, if, if you suggest it. So we did a couple of, that was all right, I could manage that. How about a loop? And I said, no thanks. Uh, that reached my limit. So we didn't do a loop. I'm, I'm, it was a bit of a coward, I'm afraid, on that occasion. And then he said, no, no, you, you fly her. So he took his hands off the controls and uh, on we went. And the weather was so beautiful and so clear, I was looking everywhere. Could see across the channel to France. It was beautiful, so clear. And um, I was enjoying myself, I must admit. And then after about ten minutes of this kind of scenic viewing, he said to me, we've come a bit low, take her up. We'd actually descended from about 10,000 feet to 5,000 feet, and I wasn't aware of it in the least. I had no sensation at all that I was, in fact, coming dangerously low. So I pulled back gently on the controls, and up she went, and we were soon back to 10,000 feet again. And um, later on, he took over, of course, as we approached the Foundra, and then we, we landed, and I was exhilarated, and went home that night and said to my father, oh, I've been flying a hunter today, Dad. Yes, pull the other one, he said. You know. <laughs> But, oh, yes, really, and, I, and the, he believed me the more I told him, and, and, and so it was. But I reflected upon that amazing experience and um, learned some very basic things which reinforced my understanding of the gospel. You see, I made a fundamental mistake, and some of you who know anything about this will know what I'm getting at. I was looking around and relying upon my senses. I had no impression of losing altitude at all. As far as I was concerned, we were just doing straight and level. But we were descending 5,000 feet in about 10 minutes. What was I not doing? I was failing to look at the altimeter. Had I looked at the altimeter, I'd have seen it indicating, as the needles went round, that we were descending. It should have been stationary, which means straight and level. Now, what am I getting at, dear friends, in this? Well, I came to understand that the altimeter was a, was a picture, to me, of the Scriptures. The infallible, inerrant truth of the Word of God, which always speaks the truth. And as every pilot knows and believes, however high you might be, I mean, for example, had the pilot said to me, Alan, how high do you think we are? Well, I could have guessed, and probably got it wrong. 
He certainly didn't say, how high do you feel we are? Um, the truth is that what I thought or felt was completely irrelevant. The important thing was what the altimeter said. That told the truth. And uh, the penny dropped. Isn't this precisely what the word of God is for us? In our Christian lives, the important thing is not, not what we think or what we feel, but what God has said. The objective truth. The altimeter told the truth. Whatever the weather was, whatever I was feeling, wherever we were going, it always told the truth. The objective truth was revealed on the altimeter. That's exactly why the Apostle Paul uh, said what he said to Timothy. In times that he was anticipating a terrible apostasy within the Christian church and within wider society, all the terrible things that we read of in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and then he begins to direct the attention of Timothy once again to the foundation of our faith. What did he say in verse 15 of 2 Timothy 3? That from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is doing. So I was inwardly rebuked for my thoughtlessness. I should have been checking the altimeter. Oh yes, look around, see the beauty of the countryside from 10,000 feet, but I should have been double-checking all the time. What does the altimeter say? But I've forgotten that completely. And I fear that that's the problem with most of us today within the Christian church. We tend all too easily to be governed by our thoughts and our feelings. Or if not our thoughts and feelings, other people's thoughts and feelings. And if they have that kind of charismatic personality that sways crowds, we so easily tend to listen to them. And although we may profess to be Protestant, we can make ordinary men, even famous men, little popes. And before we know where we are, we're taking our eyes off the altimeter, off the truth of the Word of God. And we're going astray. And unless you and I can have a renewed confidence in the Scriptures as the objective revelation of the truth of God, things can only get worse. That's why this is so very, very important. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ said to those people, no, they were not more sinners or worse sinners because the tower collapsed on them. But I tell you, except you repent, you will also likewise perish. Now when he says repent... We should remember what the word means. The Greek word metanoia literally means to think again. So when we hear the word repent, we should hear the exhortation to think again. That, I fear, is what too few people are doing these days, not least in the section of the Christian church that would claim largely to be evangelical. It's feelings that they tend to be governed by. It's what I feel God's word is saying that moves them. My dear friends, your thoughts and my thoughts, your feelings and my feelings are totally irrelevant. We should subject our thoughts and our feelings to the objective truth of the word of God. And that involves thinking. That's why Jesus said, except you repent. So... In days when the, the subjective and the emotional is, is robbing people from a lot of obvious sense when it comes to Christian things and making them vulnerable to anything. You know the recent business about the gold teeth and the Toronto blessing. You know, people persuaded that this was a true miracle of God because he changed their amalgam fillings to gold teeth. What rubbish! If God was going to give you new teeth, he would give you brand new perfect calcium ones, not gold ones. You see, the kind that I could give many examples, but I must, uh, I must uh, resist. The point is, you see, that uh, we're meant to think. And that is a fundamental concept that we must rediscover. Because what is the problem today? That we are so subjective, we're governed by our feelings and our thoughts uh, so easily, we have become the center of our thought world. Now, at the time of the Reformation, the time of the Renaissance, a man called Copernicus shook the world when he said, contrary to, a hun to hundreds of years of scientific thinking, the world is in orbit about the sun, 
and not the sun in orbit about the world. And it was called the Copernican Revolution, that the sun and not the earth was the center of the solar system. And uh, that became, in a sense, an illustration of what happened at the time of the Reformation, when Luther and Calvin and the others, they took men and women back to the word of God. And by doing that, they put God back into the center. And so, every true believer, every true Christian, is someone for whom the living God, the great creator of this vast universe, he should be in the center of everything. The center of our thoughts. The center of our ambitions. The center of everything. The trouble is, since then, I, I'm afraid, that um, God has been pushed out. At best, he's on the margins of the thought life of many, many people. But many people we know have rejected God, so church going and Christian morality is really a thing of the last century to be to bid farewell to forever. That's the way many people are thinking. But that is precisely what our blessed Lord is hinting at here. We must repent, otherwise we will perish. So God must come back into the center. We must be concerned not about our wills and our ideas and our plans and our schemes and our agendas, and be concerned about Him and His will and His agenda as revealed in the Word of God. This blessed altimeter, this objective measurement of truth, whereby, irrespective of what we think and feel, God speaks to us. And that was why the Apostle Paul was so concerned to remind Timothy of these important things. The absolute objectivity of God's truth. So we must be sticklers for this, my dear friends. There is nothing more important, because preachers, you see, here I'm slightly contradicting myself. Forgive me if you thought that me reminiscing was detracting from what I'm now doing. But that said, it is still true that the preacher's experience or anybody else's experience is not the important thing but what God says. I've only said what I've said to illustrate the word of God. So the objectivity of God's truth is the most important thing. To go back to my uh, cockpit in the Hunter T7 on that memorable day in September 1963, I thank the Lord that I have a well-qualified pilot to my left. Because had he not been there to correct me, well, what would have happened? Well, I dared think. Would I have ditched the plane in the channel? Or would I have got out of control and crashed into Hampshire? I don't know. But uh, I had a pilot beside me. And he said, we come a bit low, pull her up. He spoke, I did what he said, and we were safe. Isn't there another message here, which, praise God, we can say as Christians, that you and I are not alone. Didn't our blessed Lord say, shortly before his ascension, to the disciples, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So you and I, we're not alone. Thank God that he is still with us. And I have this fully qualified expert test pilot in the seat beside me. Otherwise, I would have been lost. And so it is that you and I, in the gospel, we have the message of a glorious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who left the glory of heaven and became a baby. In the words of the great Athanasius, the Son of God became the Son of Man, that the sons of men might become the sons of God. That's the glorious message of the incarnation, that someone came alongside us, not a mere man, but Emmanuel. God with us, because the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, says John, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, the sheer wonder of the Incarnation. Thank God we have a Savior. Thank God we have a pilot. And he, and he alone is the answer. And of course, there are those bright sparks around, aren't there, who are so self-sufficient and they despise people like you and I because we feel the need of someone else. If you're among those dear friends this evening, then you're not a Christian. If you think you can cope in life without this blessed Saviour, then you're not a Christian. But if you are among those who say, 
Pastor, I cannot contemplate life without him. He who loved me and gave himself for me, the blessed Son of God, my Saviour dear, I could not face life, I could not face death, because he alone is the one who brings me salvation uh, through his precious blood, who brings me peace with God, and who gives me the promise of everlasting life beyond the grave. I could not live without him. That's the language of a true Christian. But then there are these people who come along and say, Ah, all you people want is a crutch. Have you heard people talk like that? You need, you weak, insufficient, insipid people, you need a crutch. And you feel like saying to these people, I hope you go and break a leg. <laughs> because then, if, they, if that happens to them, and I say that in all charity, if they go and break a leg, their whole attitude towards crutches suddenly changes. They're very grateful for them. And that's the whole point, which reminds me of a very wonderful story concerned with um, William, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, John Berridge, who was one of the Methodist leaders of the 18th century. A man who, like John Wesley, was converted after he was ordained. But after his conversion, he said to uh, some people, once Jesus Christ was my walking stick, but now he is my whole crutch. I hope you don't think it's demeaning to describe our Lord in these terms. Uh, you can change the metaphor but have the same truth and say that he is your rock and your foundation, but it's the same truth. And uh, that's what John Berish said. And the true Christian leans upon the Lord Jesus Christ as our crutch, because without him we cannot consider life. If you can consider your life, if you think you can be happy and prosperous and content without the Saviour in your life, then you are not a Christian. Oh, you might be religious. You might go to church. You might even read your Bible. You might occasionally pray. But if you cannot say with the Apostle Paul, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, God forbid that I should boast save in the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ. Only a Christian says that. So we must be thankful that we have a pilot who will take us all the way and who will never leave us nor forsake us. And how important it is for us in these days to, to, to send out this message loud and clear in this multi-faith age of ours. When our blessed Lord is reduced to the level of the other gurus and religious men of the centuries. Now, even within the church, these pressures to put Buddhism and Islam and Hinduism on the same level as Christianity. My dear friends, you and I will resist this heresy and blasphemy with all our zeal, love, and passion. Why do we say that? Because it isn't as though our blessed Lord is even at the top of the league. He's in a league of his own. There's no comparing him with the others. When you think, for example, I must tell you this, we have a, an evangelistic bookstall in Norwich every Saturday, winter as well as summer. And we have some very interesting encounters with all kinds of people. And on one occasion, a young man came from Cambridge on a day trip to Norwich. And um, he proudly said that he was a Buddhist. And he was telling me about his Buddhism. And once he stopped, I started telling him about my Christianity. And uh, he was sort of umming and ahhing and listening half, you know. And then as he drifted off, I said, let me tell you this. On his deathbed, Buddha said, I have not found the truth. But we are here witnessing in the city of Norwich to him who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. His expression changed and he went silently away. And then what a thrill it was about four months later to have a letter from him saying, reminding me of that encounter. And he said, what you said to me made me think and I've now become a Christian. Isn't that glorious? And uh, it was that which challenged him, you see. The Lord Jesus said to these people, except you repent, except you think again, if you push God to the center of your life, it's time to put him back in the center. So that he should be the center of your thinking, and thus of your feeling, and of your living, and of your entire world. And that is the uniqueness of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is why the Apostle Peter said in the Acts of the Apostles that there is no other name given under heaven amongst men whereby we must be saved. My dear friends, that is where we stand as Christians. Thank God we have a pilot 
who makes himself real to us. Let me ask you this evening, is the Lord Jesus Christ real to you? Is he your pilot? Is he by your side? Are you trusting him and believing upon him? And are you, as it were, flying with him beside you? It's the only way to live. It's the only way to die. Why? Because the, the scriptures say, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. And the only hope for us is to believe upon him who shed his precious blood, that our sins might be forgiven. We need a saviour. We need a redeemer. We need a king to take hold of us, to deliver us from the power of sin, and to take us by sanctification, and to prepare us for the glory which is to come uh, in the future that waits before us. So they were the two main lessons that I learned from that flight. The objectivity of God's truth, the word of God, we have uh, a sure foundation, the impregnable rock of Holy Scripture, as Mr. Gladstone, the Victorian Prime Minister, said. He wrote a, wrote a book about that. I've got a copy of it. And that's why Martin Luther could say, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. And that's why John Wesley said, I am a man of one book. Of course, he was a man of many books. He wrote many books. But as far as his authority was concerned, I am a man of one book. And that's why Spurgeon said he would far rather defend a tiger than see need to defend the Bible. Let it out of the cage. Don't be intimidated by these hopeless people who at the end of the day have nothing to offer. They trust in their Titanics and their Concords and all their little schemes and their ambitions. My dear friends, at the end of the day, all these things didn't help those people who were plunging to earth in that doomed plane earlier this week. So I ask you, my dear friends, have you, have you repented? Have you turned to God? Have you done what the Apostle Paul said was the very uh, essence of his mission? As he said in Acts chapter 20, this was the, the whole, his whole um, evangelistic program in Acts 20 and verse uh, 20, verse 21, uh, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the problem, the ultimate problem of all the, all the problems in our world today. Because men and women are self-centered, gripped by the power of sin and of Satan. And we must, by the grace of God, repent of that and come back to God and think it, put him in the center and ourselves in orbit around him. So we are here for God's glory, not him simply in existence for our benefit. No, no. He is the one who deserves all praise and all glory for his wondrous works. For even establishing uh, the laws of science that men are able to tap into and produce these amazing things. The trouble is, you know what, they, they end up making idols of them. That's the problem. And that's why we need to repent. But of course we need power for that, don't we? And that's why the third thing that is true about that experience in that plane that we need a power which is outside ourselves. It looks as if the Rolls-Royce Olympus jets, the two port jets on the Concorde, failed. Now the Olympus is a fine engine, a splendid engine, a powerful engine. The engine in my hunter that day in September was the Rolls-Royce Avon, a kind of earlier version of that type of a jet. And um, the point is, I could not be flying, we could not be at 10,000 feet without a power outside ourselves. And isn't that the wonder of the gospel? This is why mere morality, telling people to improve their lives, to pull up their own bootstraps, pull themselves up by their bootstraps and so on, to throw ourselves back on human power and ingenuity is ultimately so cruel. Because we are... We are the victims of sin and of Satan. And unless a power greater than ourselves comes into our lives and lifts us up, we will sink and perish forever. You see, why was it that um, I took my eyes off the altimeter and the plane was gradually going down? Well, there's a thing called gravity, you see. And it, 
conspires to drag us down. We need a greater power to keep us above it. It's exactly the same thing with salvation. Sin is a wretched power which drags us all down. And that's the condition that we're all in. Some are dragged down more than others. We know that. Some hit the headlines and others don't. But we're all sinners. And but for the grace of God, we would all be dragged down by the gravitational pull of sin and end up in the pit of everlasting hell. But thank God we have a power. The power of the Holy Spirit who comes into our lives and gives us something beyond ourselves. That's why we as Christians, you see, are able to be other than we are by nature. It doesn't depend upon us. It depends upon His power. By grace are you saved through faith, says the Apostle. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. And when we hear the Gospel and confess our feebleness and our sin, and we fall at the feet of the living God in repentance and in faith, in trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, He gives us a power that enables us to live above ourselves. So we can not only fly straight and level, but even gain in height. But let me ask you, my dear brothers and sisters, are you living the Christian life as God has called you to and as you profess to do? Are you flying on course according to His holy word? You've surrendered yourself to His almighty love, His wondrous love, His almighty power, and because you have Trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your only Savior and Redeemer. He has given you a power. But the tragedy is that without Him and without the power of the Holy Spirit, there's that wretched power that drags us down. And we have to be honest and realistic here. Not only is the world increasingly being dragged down in sin and wickedness of every imaginable kind. Section 28 and all the rest, you know what I mean. But we have to be honest and say that even within the Christian church, even within the sub-constituency of the Christian church that we might call reformed and evangelical, there are things happening that should not happen. Failures to keep marriage vows, to mention one. Lack of love between Christians within churches. What are we doing? Doing Satan's work, but professing to be disciples of Jesus Christ. It's not on, my dear friends. We're being dragged down. We're losing height. And the question is, we need to be convicted about this. And to turn to our Savior, turn to our pilot and say, Lord, I'm sinking. I'm suffering temptation. I have problems in my life, but Lord Jesus, help me. And the wonderful thing is that he will help you. It's our fault if we go on losing height, if we go on sinking. He is there. Almighty and all sufficient to save. He is able to save to the uttermost all who come unto the Father by Him. So don't make excuse for your sins when all sufficient grace is available for you. Didn't our blessed Lord say on earth, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Isn't that the gospel? And you and I must demonstrate before our watching world that this gospel, this Savior, He is the only Savior. He's the only help of the world. Change and decay in all around I see, but thou who changes not, abide with me. That's it. We have a pilot, thank God. God has given him to us. In the preaching of the gospel, he offers himself to us. So there are poor men and women, young people in the grip of drugs and immorality and anything else you'd like to imagine. The Lord Jesus Christ is able to lift us up, to cleanse us in his most precious blood, to reinstate us as the children of God. So we can say with the apostle, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when that day comes when we will reach the end of our lives, whether in our beds or in an accident or through a heart attack or through a stroke, we're ready because we have him. Are you ready, my dear friends? Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ that you shall be saved. And if any of you here this evening are beginning to think that you aren't the Christian you thought you were, 
You aren't in the right plane. You haven't got the right pilot. You aren't looking to the scriptures. My dear friends, thank God it's still the day of grace. The sun has not yet set. The sun of righteousness who rose with healing in his wings, our blessed Redeemer, still shines on our benighted world. He still shines into your dark soul. And he calls you to, what? Repent. And believe the gospel. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And that is the happy message I'm able to bring this evening. That God so loved the world, not just you or you or him and her, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Come to him, trust him, believe in him. And you too will go on fine until you reach the heavenly destination. A new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And you will bless him and praise him that you have his holy word, that you have his blessed presence, and that all through your life you keep in touch with the control tower of heaven through prayer as you are led and guided until we come at last to see his blessed face. That's the gospel. So let's not be intimidated by these pathetic people who scoff at the gospel. Poor things, pray for them. And so live before them. So that your very testimony, your very life, will make them say to you, Tell me, what do you have that I haven't got? May I have it too? And you will turn to them and say, Yes, my dear friend, of course you may. Believe in this blessed Saviour. This Saviour revealed in these inerrant scriptures. And life will never be the same again. And you will bless him for all eternity. May that be true for each of us. And for many more in the days to come, until he comes in his glory and in his praise. Amen. Our final hymn is number 111. 111. Crown him with many crowns. The Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee, and hail him as thy matchless king throughout, uh, through all eternity. Hymn number 111. <laughs>
eternal God, our loving and heavenly Father, we cannot sufficiently bless and praise you for such a gift that you have made to us of your only begotten, dearly beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, revealing to us your truth and your grace. This blessed Saviour who died for the ungodly, that we might be forgiven, saved, and accepted before you. We thank you, Lord, for all your grace and mercy to us. We thank you that you are the God who still uh, sends the gospel into this dark world. For your word reminds us that you are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Saviour who wept, not only uh, who wept over Jerusalem, as well as shed his blood upon the cross. The Saviour who said, how oft would I have gathered you, as a hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. Oh Lord, we pray that you would take away from any heart here this evening, stubborn, uh, unbelieving, rebellious, with respect to any of your works and ways and providences. May we come, dear Lord, in repentance before you, and fall at your feet, and know that you are a God who freely forgives, who washes clean, who embraces us with his love. Lord, may this be true for each and every one of us. And then, dear Lord, if we rejoice to know the Lord Jesus Christ and rejoice in the, the infallible truth of your word, may we go out, as we sang earlier in the service. Uh, may uh, now let all the, the world, the arms of love that compass me, may all mankind embrace. Lord, may that be the desire of each and every one of us this evening, that we may go forth with confidence to speak of him who said, all authority and power is given unto me. Go you therefore into all the world, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And now may God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon us and bless us, and lead us by his grace throughout the rest of this, our short, uncertain, earthly life and pilgrimage, until we come to that blessed and everlasting rest, to which we are constantly called by the gospel here as Heavenly Father as we ask all these blessings in that supreme and blessed and glorious and precious and all prevailing name of our Lord and dear Redeemer Jesus Christ Amen, Amen.